Hey YouTube, it's Pruitt, and this is Jim Davis, and our class role-playing series lives to fight another day. And we're going to teach you to fight another way, but either way, this is why we fight, because it's fighters on WebDM. Fight! Fighters. Fighters? Yes, fighters, Sweet. Jim Davis. My favorite class. Let's, Your favorite let's class. Your, and you've rediscovered it recently, yes? You've played some several... A little bit. In, several fighters, quite prominent fighters recently. Yeah, yeah. in 5th edition, uh, I kind of went caster crazy a little bit. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, you know, stretching my legs. But uh, coming back to the fighter has been a lot of fun. Yeah. I'm having a great time with my half-orc. You know, it's just, it's fun having a half-orc who's just, he doesn't have a clan. He found this party. That's now his clan. He's real, he looks around. It's one of those things. It's like, family is the people you choose, right? Right, yes. And that's what he looked around. And it's like, oh, yeah, these people are, you know, I'm going to look out for them. This is like, what, a 14th level I'm 14th fighter, level now. 14th now. level. And then you've also had uh, a couple of others that made it to, like, mid-level. Fourth edition got, came close to getting the fighter right. I know a lot of people love the fourth edition fighter. But mm -hmm. to me, the fourth edition, I wasn't really feeling it. So the fifth edition one, it feels great to me. Because it's a, a solid class mechanically, I feel free to explore all these different role-playing possibilities for the class. Yeah. And don't feel hampered by having mechanics that don't support my, my concepts. What to you, because you've had such extensive experience with it, what, is it, what does it mean to be a fighter for you? Well, to be a fighter means that you have the will and some of the ability to A, defend yourself, to defend what you believe in, mm -hmm. and the right to not believe in anything. Right. If that's right. what you want. Yeah. You have the faculty to make your way in the world and adventure, and very few people can stand in your way. Yeah, like, it takes a certain amount of uh, cojones mm. to, to, li <laughs> to live in a world of moxie, uh, to live in a world of like Dungeons and Dragons world and go, there are flying creatures that can incinerate me with a thought. They're magic users mm -hmm. and powerful things. And you know what? I'm going to pick up this piece of steel and hit people with it. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, make, and make my name. And make my name for myself. I will carve my legacy across this land and you will know me and no fear. From the Trail of the Dead? Sure. More so than, say, like a barbarian who, who I see suffused with you know, their primal savagery. And the dividing line between barbarian and, and fighter to me is the training that a fighter receives versus yeah. the, the natural prowess that a barbarian has. Not that fighters can't also have natural prowess in their, their fighting styles, but like it's that training. It's the will to fight. Conquest isn't the right word, but of just like challenge yeah. and seeking to overcome uh, ad 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 adversity that I like about the fighter. Because it's otherwise sort of a generic class. Which well, can be a good thing. Yeah, I mean, no, no, definitely uh, the fighter has always been kind of a generic class, right? I mean, right, yes. you're, just, you're just good at, at hitting things. Particularly like, like old school Dungeons and Dragons, the fighter or the fighting man is a, a sort of an everyman style class. Are you a cleric? Are you a magic user? Answer no. Then, then you're a fighting man. Then the fighter in early editions of the game has to cover so much. Let's take Dragonlance for example. Yeah. It's got to cover Tika, who fights with a frying pan and a, and a rolling pin, uh -huh. as well as Sturm, who I mean I know he's a paladin and a knight, but he's he's still kind of that fighting. Caramon is another. Caramon's a different, a different beast altogether. A different beast altogether. It's got to cover all of those kind of archetypes while still leaving room for even more. Mm -hmm. that are there and I think that genericness of just this is a person who fights one who fights yeah has made its way through all the additions of course now with the subclasses you get uh, a bit of thematic element uh, that enters in through it there but the genericness of the fighter is what I like about it yeah um, and it, it, but it's also it can also be a weakness so the fighters that I think are most memorable are those fighters where the player has invested a lot into both their their idea of what their fighter is, who that person is, mm -hmm. where they trained, what they did before they started adventuring, and, and develop a strong personality and backstory for their fighters so that it can kind of like add depth and complexity to that generic class. And also gives them something like, what do they fight for? You can have the most real world examples of what a fighter is, like in our own history. Absolutely. Right? If I knew I was going to play a fighter for a long term campaign, I would look through, say, like Renaissance or, or, or even late medieval or something like, look through the histories of those. Look through, say, like the War of the Roses or any of the number of wars that took place during um, the Renaissance. And we're just talking like Western Europe at this point. And look, then there's all these little instances of, of knights and warriors and soldiers 
that start standing out, mm-hmm. and 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 you can start reading about them and going like, well, you know, this is this is what these people were like in our own world. Can I use their biography, their history? as an inspiration for something else. One of my favorite is a a soldier in Elizabethan England in the late 1500s who loved fighting so much that when a war with Spanish, with Spain was over, between England and Spain was done, and he was like, well, I I still wanna fight some more, and I guess because we're not at war anymore, I'm gonna go fight for my former enemy. He just like writes a letter to the queen. He's like, hey, so I'm still loyal to you, but I really love fighting and they're gonna pay me money. <laughs> and, yeah. and so I'm gonna go fight for these people who just a couple of weeks ago, we were besieging their cities and, mm-hmm. and, and fighting them. But you know, they've got like 70 million different wars going on right now. And he wore ostrich plume helmets and giant billowing capes. So he wanted to be noticed yeah. on the battlefield. Wanted that patronage that comes from heroic action. Uh, that that was so common during that time. Um, yeah, it's like having your flag at ACL. So when you go to the bathroom, you can get back. You like, always you know, know where exactly where it's like. Oh, always know where. I'll you're see you on be. the battlefield. You'll know me by my o- you ostrich. Know, plume. Yes, and and he then that maybe that's kind of the attitude that you have. You wear a golden war mask with a giant horse hair crest on your helmet and a phoenix feather cloak and you've got your flaming sword in one hand and your glowing shield in the other and like there's nothing subtle about that. Right, no. you're, <laughs> there's you're not. Wor- you're not worried about passing a fucking stealth check. <laughs> no, if you're dressed like that, you want people to see you. You want people to notice you. You want people to recognize that 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 you are a threat, and that and that you mean business, and also that you are sort of spreading your reputation. You're you're building a name for yourself, um, and those are the that's the kind of imagery that I like um, with the fighter. So for like some generic historical examples, we can start with like the knight or the cavalier. Mm-hmm. or something like that and then quickly move beyond to other cultures and, and, and time periods and sort of looking like, okay, well, what was, a, say, a, a Mamluk or a cataphract or a Janissary in the Middle Ages? Like, what did they do for their soldiers? How were they different than, say, the European opponents that they fought? Or maybe, like, going further uh, and looking at, like, actual samurai and moving beyond the sort of comic book, folklorish sort of take that Dungeons & Dragons mm-hmm. uses for the knight and the samurai and going, like, well, wait a second, how did they actually operate? What was their obligation to a lord? What was their obligation to other fighters? And start building a, a world and a, and a society for your fighter to it, it, it live in and inhabit. I'm not really sure how that would work out because I've read the Hagakuri many times, <laughs> the way of the samurai. Uh-huh. And pretty much every time it's just like, they go to their master and like, hey, we were in town and they talk shit about you. It's like, oh, well, they dishonored me. What did you do? It's like, oh, well, we, we, we fought them and killed them. And right. yeah, it's like, oh, well, you, you did a good thing. You 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 held, upheld my honor. Yeah. But you did take a life, so that's dishonorable. I'm going to need you to commit seppuku now. Right. So there, <laughs> there are those weird <laughs> paradoxes that can come in, and you get that when you have like a warrior society that's transitioning out of its need to be a warrior society into mm-hmm. a more, say, less violent age. That that you do tend to see these kind of like manuals for how to m- maintain that kind of like martial vigor yeah um but if you if let's say you do let's back back it up a bit what does being a part of an honorable society mean one of the things that i love about uh the the song of ice and fire books is that it really shows you like these knights that are so often upheld as chivalrous and then they're shining armor and they're they're fighting for damsels in distress and for god and country etc mm-hmm. etc they're not they're fight they're killers they're trying to survive right and you can look at historical examples of that say from like the 12 and 1300s where you have uh say marshals of england the sort of the military leaders of England advising the kings going like, yeah, you really do need to burn all these villages. We, we don't have the, the infrastructure to supply our army in the field. We are going to have to take food from people. We're yeah. going to have to take their livestock, their wheat. That's not going to, they will put up a fight. In our own world, while this was going on, there was an acknowledgement that there's this dichotomy between being a good, upstanding, virtuous knight and the actual practice of warfare, which is violence yeah. and death and murder and worse that you inflict on innocent people. And so what does that, if you're thinking about that in Dungeons and Dragons, what does that mean for your character? Yeah. How do they feel about that dichotomy? Right, right, are you, are you more of a, of a hound where you're just, you wholesale acknowledge like, no, we're killers. Yeah, we're killers. Your father's gonna be a killer. You're, yeah. You know, like I, I love that when he talks to Sam. Your son's gonna be a killer. killer. Yeah, your husband's going mm-hmm. to be a killer, yeah. you know. Yeah. And Ned Stark, who's all honorable and whatever, mm-hmm. 
But you know, back in the day when the when the moment called for it, yeah, he'll stab a guy he's in the back. Killer. He's a killer because he's, he's a killer. That's a good way to add depth and complexity to your fighter. What if they're what if they're conflicted about this? What if they're one of those one of those people that buys into the ideal, and and they have a cause that they fight for and and a a need to to justify the violence that they commit for a greater good so that they can sleep easy at night. Like that's something that you can portray in your fighters and, and really any warriors. And, and I mean, I, I, we can expand it even further to uh, every Dungeons and Dragons character ever, but specifically the fighter, because I, like I said, I like the dichotomy between being an honor, being part of an honor bound society and the actual practice of violence that that is not honorable. <laughs> and, and one of those things where if you're too honorable, you're not going to win this thing. You're not going to be deceitful. You're not going to be tricky. Yeah, because you're going to com come across uh, someone like Bronn. Right. And you're going to be Servardus. Yes. And guess what? <laughs> you're going to be going out the moon door. Right, you absolutely are. And I, I, this is one of the things where I like looking at warrior societies in our own world for inspiration because you can take something like the Vikings and other sort of medieval Scandinavian societies and they placed a value on deception and trickery and, and there's a reason Loki's a god. Right. right. There's a reason that, that that he's part of the pantheon that they that they sort of are, are worshiping. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with some having some cunning. I think that players in a Dungeons and Dragons game, if they're playing their fighters, they should keep that in mind. That it's one thing to be like, yeah, I'm the fighter. I stand in front and I fight toe to toe with my enemies, but that doesn't mean that you're stupid. Yeah. It doesn't mean that you make tactical mistakes. Right. You're not just a tank. You're not just the meat shield, even right. though that becomes kind of the, the, the joke and the cliche. It does, but it doesn't have to be. It doesn't No, it does not have to be at all. That's why it's one reason I love the battle master, because that is the, the general, the lieutenant, the captain. Right. Leading people into combat. He's telling them where to hit. You are the one, the tactician. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're you're gonna you're gonna have the party go in and you know, turn into a SWAT team. There's all this talk in, in at least the, the sort of lore of Dungeons and Dragons of fighters having a cause they fight for, right. something that they believe in that's higher than themselves. And so like, what does that mean? Is it loyalty to a lord or, 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 or something? Whether we're talking like using samurai or knights or something as the, as the basis. Is it a religious institution and you take the acolyte background for your fighter and they're like a Templar. Acolyte and say a magic initiate cleric would give them enough. They're not not quite paladins, but there's something more um, than just a fighter. They're a temple guardian or, or bodyguards for a priest or something like that. There's so many different ways that you can interpret that cause, that that thing that they're fighting for. And then you can flip it. You can say like, well, they used to fight for a cause, but no longer. And they're sort of unmoored and unanchored and right. listless. Never a good place to be, but it gives your character room to grow, find something new to fight for. Well, that goes back to the hound. I right. mean, he always had the Lannisters and the King, and then he's, you know, like, fuck the King. Then yeah, you he's got to find something else. And you have Adventures of, uh, of the Hound and the Wolf Pup, which, exactly, still, is, yes. which still is the one so, uh, <laughs> spinoff that I would love. Yes, they need to you know, give us more of that. Of course, the Hound and the Priest would also be a great one, too. Uh -huh. The most recent season. <laughs> His shit with Theros is, is amazing. It's really great. So, yes, you lean into this idea. Yes, my fighter has a cause. They, they have something that they, they fight for. Maybe they're an idealistic champion of, of a, an ideal or a person or something, like I said, it could be anything bigger than themselves. A type of monster or something like that. Maybe they ran across a, a sphinx or one of the ones that are sort of like, are they a mon they're monstrous but they're not necessarily evil yeah. kind of monsters that uh, that the fighter is sort of like, yes, I, th this this creature it embodies some sort of ideal that I want to uphold, mm -hmm. and that's where they get that um, that sort of heraldic device that uh, that they use. Could also be just for revenge. It could be more of like a Moby Dick kind of thing, where your fighter yeah. was wronged by some great beast, a dragon yeah. or whatever, and that is their sole purpose in life. That is I their sole purpose. I will find that dragon, <laughs> and I will make him feel what I have felt. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Because when you build characters like that, that gives the DM room to like pull the rug out from underneath you. What if you get to that? that beast, that, that thing, that person, that monster, whatever it was that wronged you, and all this time spent adventuring and getting the power and skills and what you need to face them, and then you get them and they've turned a new leaf. They've tried to make amends. Yeah. Um, they reach out and attempt to apologize or, or, or to seek to, to, to do something. Uh, to to wipe away the wrongs. Maybe they they're proactive, mm -hmm. and they and then they come uh, after that fighter, and the fighter thinks they're after them to, to to finish them off. But it's really like, hey, I'm on I'm on my steps. I just came to ask for your forgiveness. I just came to ask for your forgiveness. <laughs> Good thing that's exactly what I named my sword. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's where the, like the the trope of like the heartless mercenary comes in, right? right? They are a killer 
who does not care about a cause. And in, in the literature and everything that sort of inspires Dungeons and Dragons, those types of characters are deeply mistrusted. Mm -hmm. There's something about someone who's willing to kill, to fight, to, to commit violence for its own sake or, or can be bought and do that, that that makes people really mistrustful. Mercenaries, many time periods are mistrusted, hated, yeah. uh, necessary in some in some cases, uh, or, or at least from the perspective of the rulers, but never welcomed with open arms and, and seen as, a, you know, virtuous or, or yeah. you know. Uh, Berserk is a great example of that. We mm -hmm. have a mercenary mm -hmm. company being raised to the level of like knights. And yes. You have all these fighters that fought for money. Yeah. They even did the whole switch. Uh -huh. They were fighting for one and they switched over they to the other because they hired, gave them more money. Yep. Same thing in Game of Thrones with the, with the Second Sons. You so, can't trust somebody who, who does this for money. You, you just can't. Just, you just can't. And yet, uh, they're professionals. What do you want? You want a bunch of like raw recruits that only train like two weeks a year and and right? refuse to leave more than 40 days from home. Uh, like, oh, they're professionals. When you need an army, you hire professionals. I think that there's a lot of different ways that you can take it, whether you have, a, like I said, the idealistic champion on one end or the heartless mercenary on the other and, and your character falls somewhere within this spectrum. It gives you something to, regardless of what you choose, you've now given the dungeon master something that will help your character grow. But the whole point of this, whether we're talking any of the classes, is that your character's dynamic. Yeah. That where you start with your character is not where you end up with them. And we don't mean levels. We're talking about their personality, their well, yeah. beliefs, it's everything. That, yes, it's that character development that makes stories good. If there is no development, there's what's the conflict? Like, what's the reason to engage with this character? Because right. if they never change... Then something's and, wrong. Yeah, then something's yeah. wrong. And you know, my only example that I can think of uh, from in, in pop culture where that's not the case is One Punch Man. And that's the whole thing is like, he's already at the pinnacle. Right. And he's just trying to deal with that. And he's just trying to deal with it. And, and yet, and yet uh, Saitama is, is, um, is, is not happy with this situation. Mm -mm. And, and that there's something missing from his life despite his power and, and his uh, ferocity. And, and I don't know, the One Punch Man's a great show. It's a great D&D inspired show. Obviously not inspired by D&D, but you can get inspiration for oh, D&D from oh, it. It's all over the place. It's all over the place. Xanathar's Guide has some stuff. Yeah. Xanathar's Guide does have, it has uh, those random tables at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So let's run through those. The first one does talk about the heraldic sign. This is one of those where like, I would encourage players like flip through the monster manual, see which one you think is interesting. But maybe it's, it's, it's not just like, like, okay, I want this sign because it's, um, you know, because it's ferocious or, or, it's, or martial, you know, you know, sort of like embodies a type of martial virtue or something. Maybe it's tied into something in your character's background. Like I said, it could be that a monster um, is, is, you know, committed some atrocity or something in the character's background. You took Haunted One, you know, you're driven by this need for revenge and your, and your heraldic device is something that, that symbolizes that. Uh, it could be that it, it th that the device is sort of uh, represents you know, the the liege lord that you are a part of, or the the military or religious order that you're there. So it's kind of something that can give uh, the player some flavor. And if you have more than just that one, right? It's more than just the player's fighter that has that device. And maybe they go to a tournament where knowing. The, all the different symbols and symbology and everything will give you an idea of like, okay, ah, that's the person who I'm thinking of. Like, mm -hmm. the point of, of those devices is to increase a person's reputation. You might not know them personally, but you know like, oh yeah, he fights under the banner of this, or this oh, yeah. is her sign. Ah, that's right, we've never met this person, but we know them by their deeds. Yeah, yeah. Watch out, they use poison. <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah, they might be treacherous or virtuous yeah. or, or, or upstanding or, or any number. That's how you build your reputation is through these sort of signs. The next one is uh, instructor, and I, I think this is where we start getting into what distinguishes barbarians from, from fighters. Mm -hmm. In that, while a barbarian can have instruction, let's say a barbarian's like a part of a tribal group and they have, they have sort of informal training there. The point of the instructor for a fighter is that the fighter knows techniques. They have, they have trained extensively with a variety of weapons and a variety of fighting styles. Maybe you've got schools of fighting mm -hmm. in your world where it's like everyone that goes in, is in this city uh, fights in this particular style, everyone in this other city fights this one. Maybe they compete with each other. Um, maybe it's like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, where it's like, okay, you gotta get to Wudan Mountain where all the mm -hmm. monks and fighters are up there training. They're gonna give you your secrets. Yeah. They're gonna teach you the the the, uh, the secrets of their style. And you've got like 
half a dozen or so of those that train these fighters and monks and other sort of warriors and now you've got a, a society of, 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 of martial valor. It could be that they're a part of a, a big organization or a one-on-one -on -one trainer. Maybe it's a monstrous trainer, right? Yeah, you go and learn, you go and learn from that sphinx. Right, yeah. And it teaches you how to, how to fight, how, to, how fight. to fight flying creatures or yeah. like teaches you some specific aspect of fighting. Another one I love is going back to Avatar where uh, Sokka, starts to have yeah. have an existential crisis because mm -hmm. he's in the party with the cleric and right. the wizard and he doesn't have anything <laughs> he can do. Yeah. He's just, I'm just a guy with a boomerang. Yeah, right. And it's just, you need an instructor. Need an instructor. And he goes and he gets an awesome sword, uh -huh. right? Yep. And learns how to fight. The fighter, that's, they're, they're sort of an everyman type character. They're, they're a blank slate. Mm -hmm. And because they cover such a wide variety of archetypes and, and sort of concepts, you can have that like, yeah, my character doesn't really know what they're doing. Maybe you start them off at say first level and your characters picks sort of an unassuming background and you've chosen fighter because that's sort of what you were interested in. But you play them like, yeah, they're just a, a noob at this, <laughs> you know. Maybe they left their uh, their home reluctant to, reluctantly or maybe they were forced out for something. Yeah. It takes them some time till say third-ish level yeah. before they finally come into their own and become the warrior, the fighter that they that, that was always inside them. Yeah, the parents kicked them out of the house. It's right. like you're 18. It's time to get going. An old wizard comes by and pulls them out and then the bad guys attack when they're away. The instructor is one of those where it, that's what distinguishes the fighter. And I think that it's, it's rich for possibilities for dungeon masters because what if the party's fighter was trained by this great hero? Uh, and, and now the party has to, say, be involved with that hero who since retired and is, no longer has the skills that they used to have and is, 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 you know, really pushing it in terms of, like, their physical ability. You can have an NPC that's related to the party background but isn't going to overshadow the party now that they're now that they're sort of teamed up. I see it as, as rich in possibilities for organizations and schools of fighting and, and all that kind of stuff that you could mm -hmm. use to sprinkle in little side quests and things for fighters in your party. And then I guess the last one is signature style. And and this to me is like, you could have mechanical support from this through the fighting style that, that fighters get uh, or the uh, or feats if you're using those. But it's also can be just like how a player describes their attacks, how yeah. they describe fighting. This is something that I like about your style of playing because of your martial arts background. You have a good solid grasp of like striking and fighting and how a body moves and what you should do. And it's kind of like worth it if you're going to play a lot of martial characters to, to do a little bit of like research on that. So your descriptions and how you, how you portray well, yeah, your character. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, cause that's, that's what you do as a fighter is you learn how to strike between those, those between the plates in armor. Mm -hmm. Like, learn those striking points. Learn those pressure points, even though that's more monk. But right. still, there's nothing saying a fighter can't learn a few pressure points. Right. You know, they know if you pop someone under the nose, yeah. you know, you're gonna stun them. Yeah. Everybody should get into a martial <laughs> art, because sure. why not? When it, when it comes to signature style, I, I can't help but go back to, and this, like, like you mentioned, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Mm -hmm. It's the one thing I love it, when they go to, when they go to the, um, the, the inn, uh -huh. and she has that big fight and you have like all these people all of them. and they all have like I'm descending mountain whatever uh -huh. and I'm like 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 I can't not think about that like they have the one thing they're good at yeah. right yeah and even uh even going to one punch man there's uh -huh. a lot of that where it's just like they have the one thing the, the one that they thing really they're... know how to do yeah another another anime example uh what was that claymore they like have a name for their one thing right. that they can do and that that, <laughs> that is their signature combo finishing move and you know uh, you don't have to do that in D D. right but but it could be, and it, and it, it, it could be that you name your like special abilities that say you get from battle master maneuvers mm -hmm. or feet or, or something like that. Or you could just be like, yeah, I've got a variety of moves that my fighter, you know, when they're training or when they're training someone else, they call, maybe, I don't know that they would shout them out in battle, but they might, Yeah. you know, they might just get caught up in the moment. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I mean, we're talking about like the background magic of Dungeons and Dragons. Eventually, some of that must be creeping into the fighter, even if they're not even an eldritch knight. It's like these are people who are physically quite, quite tough. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of that's a consequence of the way the rules abstraction works and hit points and armor class and yada, yada, yada. We all know about it. And yeah. we're playing D&D, so we've made our peace with it. Yeah. But maybe you take that and you go, no, normal people 
top out around second or third level. Everything beyond that is the fighter's mastery of themselves, the weapons they have, the armor they wear, and there's a magic in that. Yeah. It's not overt magic. They're not casting spells, they're not creating magical effects, but they are tapping into something within the world, as it, the Dungeons and Dragons world as it exists, that gives them this supernatural ability. One of the things I love about old school D and D are the name are the name levels, right? Like so, every level has a certain name associated yeah, with yeah. it. And at some point, like around fourth level, fighters become heroes. And then around like eighth or ninth level, I forget exactly, they become superheroes. Mm -hmm. And I like thinking about it like that because they are superheroes. They are capable of doing things that normal people are not. I know this goes for all the D and D classes, but I like it for fighters. Maybe that's what your character is tapping into mm -hmm. is the sort of background magic of Dungeons and Dragons and, the, and it allows ordinary people from just like training and practice to become extraordinary, to become supernatural. What are some ways that you could play like kind of against type? Like yeah. how, would you, how would you role play a pacifist fighter? Gosh, so I mean, I think you could you could still follow one where the pacifism is, is is tempered. So is it like is it pacifism like absolutely no violence, or is it pacifism like I'm not going to kill? Because right. there are different, there are varying degrees, and yeah. in, in you could have a fighter that say fights with a, a quarter staff or a club, which is how you would probably model someone who fights with like a, a sword that's still sheathed or something like that. Or they could even fight with like a blunted sword that they mostly use to parry and disarm and push people around. And it's more there for sort of uh, defending themselves against those that have lethal uh, lethal weapons. I think having one where you're like, I don't fight at all would be a challenge <laughs> to try to to try to play and 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 maybe one of those things that you start out with like yeah my my character my fighter has sworn off violence something happened mm -hmm. that made them do this and then maybe part of your character's arc part of the growth that that comes through the game is tempering that extreme position and re and realizing something like well maybe there are times this is Dungeons and Dragons world is dangerous yeah there are monsters there yeah what's our pacifist going to do when he sees his family almost being eaten by goblins woe to whatever foe uh, causes a pacifist to go to war right exactly and, and 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 perhaps it's like one of those where your your pacifism doesn't extend to non sentient monsters and yeah. so you say like yeah I, I really try to seek to avoid violence between say the hobgoblins and and the humans but when it comes to like oozes. No, we, we, let's go. Let's go smash. Get some Kleenex and wipe this shit up. But there are examples even from our own world. I'm thinking of uh, of Muhammad Ali, right? Um, he was a fighter in the ring. Yeah. But when uh, the country was like, "We're going to draft you," he's like, "Sorry, no, no thanks." thanks. And, and it could be that. It could be that 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 for for your D and D fighter character, fighting on a one to one level is about personal excellence, is about a challenge to themselves, mm -hmm. and is about perhaps uh, maybe fighting for a cause. But fighting on a grand scale, warfare, and, and, and that is one of those that they swear off. They're like, I do not fight in wars. Yeah. And maybe that's a, a point of contention for the rulers, because they're like, yeah, this, this person over here is a tremendous fighter. Like, we would love to have them on our side, but we, but we can't win them over. They've sworn off warfare and, and instead are in, engaged in sort of like personal quests for glory and things like that. I like sometimes playing characters that have some sort of physical impairment or, or, or something. And I think fighter works really well for that, whether it's like the blind fighter or they're missing an arm or a hand or something right. like that. First off, it, it, it opens up a, a, a conceptual space for differently abled people to sort of like exist in your Dungeons and Dragons world and still partake fully in the adventures that are there. Yeah. And it also is a role playing challenge because it's like, well, how would you play a, a fighter with one hand, one arm, partially blind, fully blind, deaf, something that uh, unable to speak, um, something that like a physical impairment that maybe makes things more difficult for them or maybe doesn't. You mm -hmm. come up with your DM for how that would work exactly. But the like, let's just take the blind swordsman. This seems like a classic archetype, a classic concept. Oh yeah, um, and one that fits perfectly in a D and D world, right? Like, what's cooler than just like, yeah, I, I don't need to see. I, I I can hear you. I can 
feel your breath on my skin. I mm -hmm. know where you are. I can feel. I can hear your armor uh, as it scrapes against themselves. I can hear you draw your sword from your scabbard. That opens that up. And in some of these cases, you might not say like that. There's any mechanics that are going on at all. Sometimes you get a question about it, and some and and someone will say like, "How would you do it with like a, a blind swordsman?" That's a, a conceptual thing that the player uses to describe themselves and everything. Um, there are some things they wouldn't be able to do, but for the most part, mechanically, I wouldn't make many changes. Mm -hmm. Like they, I probably wouldn't be like, yeah, you can't cast spells at, at things that require you to see a target. Um, but other than that- But would you still impose the, I don't know these are more fluffy shows, but would you still impose the, the mechanical I, I would, if it, was, if it was important for the player to have a, a, a blind character because they're going for a concept, then I don't think that I would. I, I, particularly if it's, it's something like, uh, um, what is it, Zatoichi, uh, the blind swordsman? I forget, yes. somebody in the comments will help us out. Yeah. Or like Daredevil, right? Daredevil. Then you're playing a character who's on stick. the- Stick. You're playing on the, the back end of a character who's learned to live with this and right. learned to fight. And not just kind of fight, learn to fight really well. Yes. And so I, would, I wouldn't impose that, that, that penalty um, I, I just wouldn't. Yeah, see, I, I now I kind of want to do a blind swordsman and just do a human. And for yeah. that bonus feat, be like, can I just do like blind sense? Like 30, some kind of blind sense Blind sense, sense type 30 feet. feet yeah. yeah. Or whatever. Or, or just do like, hey, just don't impose the, you know, uh, disadvantage advantage for fighting. Yeah. And yes, perception checks for sight are at disadvantage. Sure. But anything else, I mean, hearing, smell, there's many ways to perceive the world. Right. You have all these other senses. That's, and that's just right? the physical senses that you have, not counting the magical senses that are available to characters in a Dungeons and Dragons world, not counting uh, the, 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 the avatar of a god of battle reaching down to a mortal who's training and trying so hard to, to, uh, you know, to become a, a fighter and to, to master the, the weapons and armor and saying like, yes, I understand that you're, you're dealing with this, let me bless you. Mm -hmm. Let me, or, or a monster doing something similar and saying like, yeah, I, I see you over there. Uh, let me let me impart some of my power on you, and it gives the. It, I don't know why it is with fighters that this is where I go, right? Yeah. Like, it, but it, to me, like the the fact that fighters are so physical, they're so, um, you know, they're, they're athletic and they're they're jumping and swinging and taking mm -hmm. hits, and to have one that has a physical impairment is uh, I, I find interesting. Yeah. And, and or I mean, look at look at Furiosa from Mad Max Fury Road. Right. She's like, she's basically a fighter. Yeah. In a world, and that's the one thing about that movie is no one mentions no one mentions her mechanical movie, arm at all. The yeah. fact that she only has one arm and has a yeah. mechanical like it's literally not even it's relevant. It's irrelevant, yeah. like because she's obviously more than capable of and living, yet existing. And yet it says so much about the world and her. Yeah, uh, that, and that's what that's what I like about these kinds of things. And you could say the same for sort of mental impairments or sort of emotional, just any kind of thing like that. But I, I like the the physical ones mm -hmm. for uh, for fighters myself. Yeah, you totally gave me an idea though. Yeah, the whole god of battle thing. Like, imagine a blind fighter who this god of battle blesses him with two metal ball bearing eyes uh -huh. and he can he can't see he can only see metal ah so he can see the armor floating in space the sword coming so at him but he perceive can't perceive the magnetic he can field perceive or that but he can't see anything else that's pretty cool i don't know yeah i'm gonna make that character well let's go do that <laughs> <laughs> Or that uh, <laughs> that that um, that one episode of Star Trek where they get to the planet where they're playing war uh -huh. and having people go into incinerators mm -hmm. just, just to keep the in, the, the keep it yeah the war they're complex like this going. is how this is how many people would have died it's time for you to go get incinerated but at least our cities aren't destroyed yeah that was one of the ones that's that's kind of an episode where there's the, they're showing you the absurdity of, of of so many things that have to do with war taken mm -hmm. to their just absurd I really liked that one that one's great oh yeah well Captain your thirty percent of your crew must die. They were destroyed in the attack. Oh, like, no, no, no. What? The whole Enterprise was destroyed. Oh, the, whole the, Enterprise the Enterprise was destroyed. was destroyed in the last attack. You're mm -hmm. going to need to have all your people beam down and walk into our incineration chambers, yeah. please. It's like... <laughs> 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 My name's Kirk. I'm here to do two things. That's a great adventure scene. Kiss scene. chicks and kick ass. <laughs> That's a great adventure scene for, like, Modrons or something, right? Like... You mm. just like, the Modron army came through, and, and the, the Modron... Like, the Modron army comes in, and then a bunch of, like, accountants 
and bean counters and surveyors walk to the front and they meet with the delegation and they're like, by our calculations, you will suffer 80% casualties. Please have 80%. <laughs> Well, they don't, they, yeah, it's just war is theory craft. Uh -huh, and they, they agree, like, well, look at our forces. We have cavalry. You don't. We have air support. You don't. You don't. You don't. You're probably going to lose 75% of your forces. We'll lose 30, but we yeah. would win this fight. We would win this fight. Right. It's acceptable losses. Uh, please have your, you know, mm -hmm. send us a proportion of your units. Uh, and then, then, yeah, <laughs> you could do that. You have to negotiate between those two things. Um, it's a good planar adventure. It so maybe an awesome Arcadia plane. or Acheron or one of the other sort of lawful line planes. Mm. Um, yeah. What if the chaos? Yeah, that's how they maintain like mechanists and all that. Mm -hmm. The chaos of actual war. Yeah, they got to get rid. Yeah, there's nothing about war that's lawful. It's mm. very chaotic. They should read their Clausewitz. Yeah. Um, yeah.